That's right. It's time for your Sports Bros podcast. It is Wednesday evening, December 16th, 2015, and I am Andy Karstner, a.k.a. Big Bro, coming at you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Yeah, you guys are getting a lot of snow out there in Klamath Falls, too, aren't you? It's, it's, it's nice. It's a winter wonderland out here, but it's bitter cold and icy on the streets. It's something you haven't had for a year either because you were in Arizona last Christmas, right? That's right. We were riding bikes with shorts and, sh- and short sleeve shirts last year on Christmas morning. It and was- that's what I'm going to do this year. And that's what I've done the last three years because San Antonio, I think right now the forecast for Christmas is right around 75 degrees and wow. perfect level. And we're supposed to get a, quote, cold front where it's going to get into the high 30s overnight here the next three days. That's kind of what we consider our cold front center. We get about two weeks a year where we actually get ice and uh, (laughs) people in San Antonio start buying out generators and we start having looting going on down here because they have no idea what's going on when that kind of stuff happens. Well, you know, it is December and that means it's bowl season and so that's going to be on our on our topics today make sure you follow us at sports bros our online home is torn by sports.com you can read all our articles download all our podcasts also on itunes or stitcher if you don't listen to them live we're also on youtube so we're going to jump right into it tonight obviously i mean the last 11 days have just been, I think, a whirlwind of BYU news with Bronco Mendenhall announcing um, he's leaving for UVA, the coaching search starting up, the Holy War in Sin City being announced, and um, I mean, there's just so much to talk about. What do you want to start with first, Aaron? Do you want to start with the Holy War, or do you want to start with today's news about the coaching search? I think we need to kind of break the mold of the last two weeks being all about the coaching search and let's focus a lot on the holy war so there start with the coaching search and then we'll go into the bulk of us talking about the holy war that's coming up here in a couple days well i mean here so obviously for those of you who are hiding under a rock news came out today that ken niamatololo who is widely thought to be the number one choice of tom homo to um <laughs> to replace bronco Mendenhall as a head coach um, yes, that is my wife. Um, sh- he announced today that he is actually going to be staying at Navy instead of coming over to BYU. Um, I wrote on tornbysports.com as soon as the Bronco Mendenhall news broke, I wrote that I thought Ken Montalolo was the front runner for lots of reasons. I mean, I think other than Kyle Whittingham, um, he kind of led the pack as far as experience head coaching goes, right? There's plenty of... Um, assistant coaches, and of course, there's a couple guys in the NFL that I'm just leaving out of this. But as far as head coaching in college goes right now, he by far has the most experience except Ken uh, Kyle Whittingham. Um, and then on top of that, he was in Meet the Mormons. He's been, been been very outspoken about his faith. In fact, he said that he only even took the interview at BYU because of his faith. This shows that he was the type of guy that Tom Homo and you know the board of trustees at BYU was were looking for. Um, I've always said that, but today the news comes out, and uh, you know we we ran a Twitter poll, um, and it it was a good majority of uh, of BYU fans were actually kind of relieved about it. Why? What do you think about that, and why do you think so many BYU fans were relieved about this Ken Niamatololo news? I, I think it's really really simple where the relief comes from, and I think everybody was just beyond nervous of bringing in the triple option because Niamatololo has run that his entire career. He ran that as a player as well. I um, mean, had a short stint UNLV running some pro style type stuff. I think we were just all nervous of him bringing in the triple option, not being to, able to adapt to um, athletes and players that have a real system, but for lack of a better term, uh, a system that plays, you know, that anybody can play in. Um, and so I think, I think a lot of BYU fans were nervous about Neil Montalolo for that reason alone. Um, and because, and, and so it makes you th- wonder if he came, he took a couple days, which I think a lot of people that surprised as well. Um, I, I have to think that, the reason he ended up turning it down is again, this is pure speculation. I'm not reporting anything, but BYU probably told him, Hey, you can't run the triple option. And he Matalolo probably is like, I don't know any offensive coordinators out there that don't know how to run anything other than that. Cause that's all he's done his whole life. You, you, I, I really got to wonder if that played a factor in his decision because he, he kept saying how he, BYU was different. It was his faith. He wouldn't really talk to anybody else. So I had a feeling that he went into that interview more or less thinking, I'm going to take this job unless they don't 
put something on the table that I'm looking for. I don't think it was a money thing. I don't think he's about money. They're, they're going to make comparable salaries, um, you know, maybe plus or minus a couple hundred thousand dollars. But um, I, I think, honestly, I think that's why fans were nervous. And I think that's why he ultimately turned it down. I think his family was the huge pull. He was going to be able to coach his son and another son was going to nearby. And who knows if he would have transferred over there. Um, the faith was a huge string. I think this was a football move. And I don't think the football environment at BYU is conducive to new Matalolo style. I actually, I actually disagree. Um, I, I think it was a lot of things. I think um, to start off, I hate to admit this, but I think it's true that the BYU job is not that much of a step up from Navy, right? I mean, no one, I think, I don't think anybody is under the illusion that had he been offered the USC job, I mean, not that the USA job is open, but you know, a, a job at USC or Nebraska or Michigan or Florida, he would have turned it down as a career move. I think he would have done something like that. But since BYU is maybe a small step up, it just wasn't enough to, to bring him over. The faith thing was definitely the thing driving him to get on the interview, but there's so many other things going in. He is knee deep in Navy and that's great. I mean, of all places to be completely committed to, that's a great place to be committed to. And, um, you know, he is the winningest coach there. He will probably coach there for a number, another 10 years and end up being the Lavelle Edwards of Navy. Really. I mean, I think is what he'll end up being at Navy and, and, I do think that Navy probably came back at him with a with a with a absolutely. Counter. You you, you know got to I mean? they were going to do everything they could to yeah, keep they, him, they, and, they, and they should have open, open about that. Yeah, absolutely. They, absolutely. I, and you know, somebody uh, Notre Blaine uh, at Blaine Jacob on Twitter just said he used BYU for the race. I don't. I don't think he used them for that. I think that's what ended up happening, though. I think. Nia Matalolo really went into BYU really genuinely thinking, hey, there's a potential for me to move here. And then Navy's like, well, okay, in that case, here's another million dollars of taxpayers' dollars a year that you can have. And I think I think that ended I think I don't think money was the reason, but I think it ended up being that Navy was like, well, if they're going to offer you that, we'll give you a little bit more. I think that's what I, I don't think it was the reason. I think it was a reason. I mean, yes, when you're exactly. talking BYU ceiling, it, it, most people kind of think is around two, two point two, two point three mil is what his BYU's kind of ceiling is thought to be. I think Navy's going to be closer in the three million range after this whole thing i think he they he, they probably came back and said we can restructure your contract you know and then of course you add in the the free car and the free house uh, it all i think that all played a, a role in it his he's knee deep like i said he's knee deep in navy and he, he he loves the players he loves the school he loves what it stands for he has full control there he can continue like you said to do the triple option i think that was a small part but i think it is a part um and when you think of it all it's just byu was not enough of a career step up in his career to justify leaving all that it, it basically just it, it's kind of like getting you know a transfer job right i mean if you're if your boss comes to you and says hey aaron you live in san or you live in san antonio uh i want to move you to i don't know tallahassee florida i'll pay you you know l less money and you'll basically be doing the exact same job what do you think? You know, it, it's just that kind of thing. It just wasn't enough to draw him out. And, and Navy did everything they could to keep him. So I do think, unfortunately, that it's a bit of, a, of an indictment on the prestige of the BYU coaching position. Um, because if you can't get someone to leave Navy that has historically been not that good, even though they're, they've had some – recent success to come to BYU who has a national championship and Heisman trophy winner. And um, one of the top, I think 10 or 15 winning as teams in the last 30 years. Uh, you know, if you can't get Kenny and Montalolo to come, then I don't think you're going to get anybody with experience. I think the assistant to head coach is Bronco Mendenhall is the mold, right? Well, but and it's especially in, and it's not, I think you, I think you hit the good points, but I think the main reason that is, is because of the limited pool. You have the limited pool because of the LDS. You have to be active LDS. And because of that, that alone goes from 300 coaches down to about 10. And then out of those 10 coaches, you know, two are head coach, you know, or in this case, three are head coaches. And like you said, those head coaches, it's either a minimal step up or, you know, for some people like Kyle Whittingham, it's a step down. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think, I think BYU's coaches moving forward are always going to be assistants stepping up or somebody 
like a Bronco Mendenhall that, you know, has that type of just deep rooted value based system to come there. I, otherwise I, I agree. I think it's going to be assistance from here on out, whether, you know, if it's Sataki now um, and wh- however long he goes, um, I, I think that's the route that BYU will have to have. And it's nerve wracking for Cougar fans, especially, <clears throat> and I've touched on this a little bit in an article I posted on torn by sports.com called the fallout of Bronco that BYU fans are, are just very entitled now. Um, mm-hmm. After 10, 11 seasons of Bronco going to bowl games, you know, uh, you know, four or five, 10 win seasons in there, um, beating some nationally prominent teams, getting an ESPN deal, BYU is really set up for the fan right now. BYU fans have been very spoiled in Bronco's tenure, and because of that, they want more. They want more wins. They want more money. They want more accessibility. They want P5 accessibility or P5 um, inclusion. And anything like BYU fans are just just so critical of everything. And so when they hear this idea of another assistant coming in, it scares them because they're like, Oh my gosh, now we're going to have two to three years of building and and this coach getting his feet under him. When the fact is that's what Bronco was. And now not everybody's going to be a Bronco or or Kyle Whittingham for that matter, or those guys that go from assistant to head coach and are immediately successful. Not everybody is that way. And again, if it's Sataki, he might not be that way. Everything indicates that he will be. I mean, there's a reason he's the number 25 highest paid public assistant coach in the country. It's not just by coincidence. So he obviously has some abilities, but does that transition to BYU head coaching and head coaching in general? Um, you know, I, I do want to bring one thing up that um, a lot of people are talking about on, on Twitter, and we, we got a, a, a decent um, comment here from at Brent M. Chesney. It's never actually been reported that he was officially offered the job. So, I mean, just to be clear, it's not clear that he turned down an offer. But, I mean, clearly he knew he was in the running, and I think it was a courtesy to BYU at the very least to say, I'm not interested, right? I mean, even if the, the offer wasn't extended. Um, but to your point about assistance, um, uh, it's just the reality of where BYU is and where I think everybody in that kind of level uh, of, of football is. Even Kyle Whittingham, who's by all measurements – a great coach. He was an assistant. This was, and Utah was his first, um, you know, head coaching job. And before him was, um, was urban Meyer, of course. And he had some head coaching experience at Bowling Green, but I think everyone understands that Utah's a step up from Bowling Green, but schools like BYU just don't have the pickings, right? They don't just, of course, BYU has a religious thing, but other than just religious thing, BYU is not at a place where they can just be going out to schools and picking off head coaches, you know, even even navies. You know, or, I, mean, I just don't expect BYU to be able to have that kind of success getting head coaches. So assistance is where I think most of this is gonna gonna come from. And you know, I tweeted out Kalani Sataki um, is riskier because he doesn't have the head coaching experience. Um, but I think a lot of people see him. I mean, to make the comparison to recruiting and and the NBA draft and things like that, I feel like Kalani Sataki has a higher upside, which is why a lot of people are very excited about Kalani Sataki and weren't quite as excited about Ken Niamatololo. Um, you know, and I say upside. I understand it's not a, a pr- precise analogy, but I, he just seems to be like the type of guy that's going to recruit better than I think Ken Niamatololo will. I mean, Ken Niamatololo has been on the East Coast for the last 10 years. Um, and he's going to come out and all of a sudden start recruiting West Coasters. He just doesn't have that network. But in general, Sataki's known for recruiting. He's known for being passionate. He's been known for being a BYU guy. And I think a lot of people view that as kind of the spark that BYU has been lacking. Um, over the past, well, frankly, the past 11 years. And Bronco did a great thing. And one last thing about assistants versus head coaches. Um, if Kalani Sataki is the guy, and I fully expect him to be um, the, the guy going forward, if he is the guy, he has one advantage that Bronco, and and well, the Bronco did not have coming in, and, they, and that Kyle Whittingham did have going into Utah, and that is a running start with a lot of talent. Bronco inherited a terrible team that had been drugged through the mud by by Gary Croton and ridden with scandals and tons of expulsions and and and, and several years of subpar, very subpar play. Kalani Sataki, if he's the coach, he can come in and have guys to work with right off the bat, you know? And that's something that I think would be different. And he might not take a couple years like Bronco did. And even Bronco actually did it relatively quick. But he might not need a couple years to get BYU to the next level. I mean, you talk about, you know, 
quarter uh, freshman of the year in in Tanner Mangum, uh, returning Jamal Williams, who by the way has been tweeting BYU stuff lately. So I fully expect him to come back. Um, you know, and a lot of people excited about Squad like Canada and Nick Kurtz coming back and and most of the offensive line coming back. Uh, you know, the Warner Brothers, it, a lot. Uh, he has a lot to work with, a lot more than Bronco Menon and Hall had absolutely. Absolutely. in 2004. You're absolutely right. And I, I think not only that, but then when you look at the schedule that he has to go up against, that automatically has got to get a, a fire lit under a coach. You've, you've got to imagine. There's no doubt. <clears throat> I, I agree with you. I think Sataki is the guy. Personally, you know, I think there's a lot of people in, in the Twitter sphere and the BYU Nation, and honestly, even Utah. For some reason, Utah fans are extremely obsessed with following the search as well. I don't know if it's on the troll side of things, or honestly, they maybe they're worried Whittingham's going to come down. I don't think he will. <laughs> no um, way. But I, I, I think a lot of people are, were wondering and worried why it took so long for things to be, you know, for interviews to be uh, conducted and that, you know, it was maybe a slap in somebody's face. I really think all it is, is just a problem process you got to gauge guys interest and then you got to work out logistics the clo- you know the um the dead period for recruiting just started yesterday or a couple days ago and so you know kalani was out recruiting and you got to imagine um Nima Tololo, you know was preparing obviously for army navy and if lance anderson was in utah recruiting so there's all those things you have to work out I, I don't you know and then there's people getting upset about the time frame that it's taking and it's just kind of ridiculous so i think we want to close up this coaching thing we it's been beaten to death for yeah. two weeks now and, I fully I mean, expect it to be up. Kalani Sataki, though. I, I expect that 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 to be announced um, tomorrow or the next day. I really do. Yeah, I, I agree. I and that was what I was leading towards. And I, I'd be shocked if they wait till afterwards. If they wait till afterwards, just to throw this out there, the longer they wait, and if it's after the bowl game, the more I believe Kyle Whittingham is in play. I still don't think Kyle Whittingham would step down. But you got to imagine they wouldn't announce the hire if it was Kyle Winningham before the game, and it would only go after. If it's Sataki, you got to imagine it's got to be in the next day or two. If he is truly in, I agree. If we go, if we go into Saturday morning without announcement, then I actually start getting my hopes up for Kyle Winningham. If not, I I totally expect Kalani Sataki to be announced within the next couple days. Our source on the matter said that if offered the job, he would take it, um, and that he was interviewing. So. I mean, it was announced. It was it was reported widely. Deseret News and Salt Lake Tribune um, reporting that he was interviewing for it. So, um, all that being said, it, it does need to be announced as soon as possible. We're already seeing um, a major recruit tweeting today that he was going to. Well, he 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 had postponed his announcement of of his commitment. Um, reportedly because he wanted to see who BYU was going to hire as a coach. We saw Troy Warner tweet out um, photos of his official visit to USC this week. I spoke to someone close to Troy Warner and asked this person whether uh, Troy Warner was decommitting. And sadly, this person said he doesn't know. I expected him to give me a straight answer of no. And this person said, said, said to me, um, I don't know. Um, he's been really busy and I haven't been able to really talk to him, but that, that was not a good sign to me to see Troy Warner tweeting out USC pictures. Um, he, he still has BYU, you know, as his pinned tweet on his, on his, um, Twitter account and everything. So, so far so good, but this needs to happen fast. Recruits are fickle. I mean, they're very, very fickle. We've seen it. I mean, if Troy Warner does decommit, it's his second time decommitting (laughs) in this process. Right. You know, so anyhow, We'll, we'll move on from coaching. The fun stuff is going on on Twitter right now because earlier tonight, um, Utah player, I'm going to b- butcher the name, but Sinai, is it Sinai or Seni? Seni Faunuku um, at the joint team dinner slash dance off, I think is what it was, mm-hmm. somehow got a hold of the mic and someone started filming him and he said uh y'all BYU team y'all a good team but y'all a dirty team and of course that went viral and BYU fans go crazy Utah fans are laughing and everything's going insane and then I this is what I actually thought was the most interesting part of it all because that was I, I mean that's just good rivalry fine it really is but Jared Lloyd reported that after he got the mic taken away from him like right after he did the that cutthroat signal right there yeah yeah uh jared lloyd reported that he then said we're gonna legally cut y'all on every play like cut block right Right, which is a dangerous but technically legal move and that's where it kind of 
like to me went over the hill like i can laugh and just like okay great everyone i can't really honestly blame people for you know slapping BYU with that label they haven't done a whole lot to help themselves out in, in the last year or so on that and so I, I could kind of chuckle at that but when i heard what jared lloyd said that he said they're going to cut block BYU on every play that's when i said that's the holy war that we all know that, hate. that's that's what's been missing for a year and a half and at the same time part of me doesn't miss it but at the same time you knew it was going to come and it was just who was going to be the first one to take the blow and and the Utes got the first opportunity and they took it and that's what it's going to be for the next couple of days is just you know, as these teams do activities together and they do some separately as well um it's going to be you know some some back and forth banter it's 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 what's going to happen as long as it stays um somewhat civil i mean i don't mind this i mean yeah it, it's a shot and like you said byu set themselves up for this it's not they they have every you know utah's every right to call them out on that at least from what's been publicly displayed oh, sure. of byu um now you you know bronco is going to be telling his players be the bigger guy don't don't fight back you know or don't say something back somebody's going to say it. There, there is going to be a byu player whether it be on twitter whether it be um in another group thing that's going to say something he may not say something like this or not, but there's a guy that will do it. I don't know who it will be, but it's, you know, might be a fourth string kicker. I don't know, but uh, you know, Johnny Linehan might take to Twitter and let them all know, you know, we got, we got a couple Aussie hunters um, going on between here. So let, let's just, this, this shifts perfectly into our thing. I just asked everybody on Twitter, what's their favorite Holy war moment? Because there's so many great ones. We're obviously BYU centered. We've really, um, dug into our our favorite holy war moment together as the sports bros um was the 2001 game with luke staley uh taking it up the sidelines from 20 yards out and then Gennaro guilford um taking the pick you know about 50 yards to seal it we yeah. stormed the field that's ours um a lot of people are coming in with some of theirs as well obviously you've got to imagine that the, the johnny harleen answered prayer has got to be up there from a byu fan perspective what's another one andy from you aside from those two that you remember in particular as one of your favorite well, this is of moments? course um this, this is of course max hall to andrew george <clears throat> over the middle um there's fourth and 17 to austin collie um those are kind of the, the the ones that come to mind obviously luke staley down the sideline to me is the best i i guess I can't really explain why. Well, I can't explain why I like it more than Beck to Harleen. Beck to Harleen was amazing, and, and you and I were together watching that game, and we'll always remember celebrating that that win as well. But Staley down the sideline, um, we were there, obviously, and I won't you know tell the story the, too long for the thousandth time. But we were there. We were on that sideline. We rushed the field. Um, it was just that year was a special year. It was a special, special year. 2001, I think, was the last time BYU had that really special feeling. Like, this was a team for the ages. Um, you know, that's why I think all that put together and just realizing at that point what Luke Staley was. I mean, I still watch that replay of him running down the sideline and can't believe a man that tall and with such a long gait could 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 run like that. I mean, he was so fast and so strong and so tall and so big that he, he was just a beauty to watch. And so and I love Luke Staley and he's from Oregon and that's where we're from. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's got that's that's it was just so fun. I think being in person makes it that much more exciting. Obviously, watching on TV is great, and we have some amazing uh, memories as a family um, on TV. But being there in person is just one more thing. Um, okay, so now here's a question that I posed a couple days ago. For some reason, whenever BYU was won here in the last honestly about 20 years, maybe 15 years or so, yeah. it's always been last drive, last play you know, within seven, they can never get those double digit wins. All the double digit wins go to Utah. Um, you know, the 54 to 10 absolute beat down, you know, everything like that. Utah gets the blowouts, BYU gets the close wins. What would you rather have a BYU close win or a BYU large margin victory? Oh, large margin. No doubt. I mean, the close games are arguably funner to watch, but a blowout, but BYU needs a blowout to shut up the 54 to 10. I mean, that 54 to 10 has become like a full sentence in, in, in Utah talk, you know, like people can just say 54 to 10 and it ends the conversation, you know, um, I, there is, I mean, it, it didn't feel like a close game, but a couple of years ago, if you remember with Riley Nelson with the three times Utah, um, rushed the field that they were going down the field to tie up the game, 
you know, so that was a close win as well for Utah, but it was a close win. They haven't all been 54 to 10. It's just that BYU no. hasn't blown them out by, I think, more than seven to 10 points in, in something like 20 years. I mean, it's been a long time. Um, I, and I've been saying this for years about BYU. BYU has never, ever played with the edge and chip on the shoulder that Utah has. And it's all because it's all because of what's going on on our Twitter line right now, thanks to a post that you put out there. <laughs> I know <laughs> Twitter feed is this, going this crazy is, right now. This fits in perfectly because BYU players, fans, coaching staff, administration, whatever you want to call it, has a holier than thou attitude. Magic happens. I hate Utah. You know the the church. And we are getting ripped to shreds on Twitter right now by Utah because Andy tweeted out a picture of the University of Utah core values that we mockingly share because they are so. Yeah. Well, what I said was I love getting morality Pretty lectures from. <laughs> I said I love getting morality lectures from fans of a school with these quote core values. Those core values being no drugs, honesty, treat women with respect, no stealing, and no DUIs. I mean, I, I love to make fun of them, and you know, Utah Twitter's going crazy um, <laughs> right now. But oh, it, it, it's it's all good fun. But Utah players have a chip on their shoulder. They always have something to it, prove. It's the chip They're always they, playing they, they with emotion. That BYU is not the holier-than-thou school because BYU walks around with, with their shoulders a little bit higher because they're like, oh, we're BYU players. And Utah players are like, well, we don't care about your holier-than-thou, you know, Jesus Christ-worshipping people. They're just like, we're just going to go and play some football. And because they don't have the honor code, they don't have – a 90% LDS rate on their team. Now they have a high percentage, obviously. I mean, there's a great deal of them. But the fact of the matter is, I think it just comes down to this. Utah's just sick of hearing that, especially you fans. You fans are sick of BYU fans playing that that's card. And that's why our Twitter line is being destroyed right now by people mocking us, you know, ass acting as if we feel those values are not good values. They're great values, but the fact yeah. that they have to post them is what we're making. That, so that's number one. I think you're right. I think Utah fans and players have always hated BYU more than vice versa. And that's coming from me, and I hate the University of Utah. Um, but it's always oh, been you there. Them? Do you think the whole organization is classless? Everything about uh, them? I and Max <laughs> Hall, yes. We, we agree on that. Um, but the, and that's that's totally true. And my the second point that I think is also true is uh, that BYU, and you, you've touched on this a lot as well, BYU fans and players are entitled. They feel entitled. We we have that national championship, that, that Heisman, tons of WAC championships, tons of Mountain West championships, tons of, you know, lots of great things to brag about. Um, and BYU fans, both in basketball and in football, fans and players, I feel like they walk into games more confident than they need to be. And they kind of play lackadaisical. Um, because I, I really do feel like there's a sense of entitlement, a sense of false confidence. Utah plays with a swagger. BYU plays with a false confidence. And that just lends itself to you make a few mistakes, you be Jay Keeps and try to pick it up and throw it out of the end zone and you throw it backwards on accident. Like that comes from lackadaisical play while U Utah is playing with their ears pinned back, trying to clobber every BYU player on every, on every play. So <clears throat> I think you, those two things really play into why Utah tends to have more blowout wins than BYU. Do you think BYU with you – no, know, th this has been a common topic of discussion, and I've started to sway a different way from where I started, but do you think BYU for this particular game comes out a little more fired up, a little yes. more energy, yes. or because of the coaching search, do you think that does anything? No, and I've been saying – and I've been saying that all week. I, I think this is going to be the most amped up, energized BYU football team we've seen in decades. I really do. There are just so much going on right now that I think these players are going to be so motivated and are going to play so emotional. And I think that's a good thing um, that I think will help the BYU team. Yeah, I, I started out on the other end. I started out very nervous especially as the the coaching stuff came out and then you know three four days later it was the offensive uh staff going and then three four days later it was the defensive staff going and it was just kind of this like 
slow process of, hey, we're leaving you guys, but we're going to stay for a couple weeks. And then the more I thought about it, hey, they're just putting in a two weeks notice, you know, and then they just, but the thing is when anybody else puts in a two weeks notice, you ever watch their productivity in those two weeks? They start <laughs> here and they just go like that. Yeah. So that, that oh, uh, short timers disease is what they call it. it. Yeah, yeah. It got me worried at the beginning, but the more I've heard interviews um, of players and, and honestly, even some coaches, um, especially Guy Holiday, which we'll touch on that in just a second, but um, it's got me, I, I think, and we've touched on this and a lot of the media has that if this was anybody other than Utah, I think BYU would probably get blown out in this bowl game. I really do. Mm-hmm. I think, I think if BYU were playing Washington state where they have very little motivation to play a, a, a team that's good once a decade. And this is their one time that they're good this year. Um, and then their coaching staff is all leaving them minus three, three coaches, uh, whatever they're there. They are that team. Every bowl game has that team that doesn't want to be there. Um, and then Utah would, or that team would have pounced them. But I think because it's Utah, because they had a year off last year, some of the seniors that hadn't, hasn't, haven't beat Utah and even some of the juniors that haven't beat Utah, um, this is their opportunity. And then the te- the players that love Bronco want to send him off. I think that is the only reason that this is going to be a good game. And BYU has a shot. I think there's, I think, I think, they're da- they were downplaying the coaching thing a little more, but the more that I've heard, the more I have confidence that these guys are fired up and ready to go. Now, Utah is the team that I think has that little bit of, we don't want to be here. We have nothing to gain mm-hmm. here. We're a top 20 team. And I think, I think there's validity behind that. I think, I think Utah so has talked about it last week. in the book. Yeah, we, we did. Utah wanted to be somewhere else, but the fact of the matter is your brand is what your brand is. And there's a reason you fell on number six. That's not a shot on Utah. I'm saying that's what the bulls, felt about you now ironically washington state was picked above them and has only sold about two thousand of their student ticket a lot because they're going to el paso that's a little far from eastern washington but i think the cougars are amped i'm with you i think they have every reason to be amped but now the thing is will they show it on the field is the product that byu has now within the last couple decades better than what they've been when they've had every other reason to get up for utah so quick last segment here um last couple minutes let's actually talk about football (laughs) right so let's talk a little bit about matchups and and what you expect to see um utah has a great defense but has at times shown a little bit of weakness in the secondary. I expect BYU to do what they've done for the past four or five weeks, really consistent, and that is throw the ball deep a lot. Um, I, I think BYU has been a big team play, a big play team for the first time for, in a long time since, I gosh, I don't know, maybe since the 2001 team. that they've, uh, they've been doing a lot of long plays, and it's paid off. Um, you know, since the beginning of the year when Mitch Matthews and Nick Kurtz looked kind of soft and didn't really go up for balls, since they got punched in the mouth by Michigan, those, re- those receivers have responded. I expect them to come in fired up to get Bronco his 100th win, fired up to get their 10th win, and fired up to get their first and only win over Utah when you talk about guys like Mitch Matthews. Um, so this, I expect the deep ball. I expect um, BYU's defense to play very aggressively. I, I expect, kind of, you know, Broncos playing with, you know, to use a Vegas term, <laughs> Broncos <House> playing <laughs> with uh, – with house money. With house money. <laughs> right? Bronco's playing with house money. He's leaving. I mean, he can pull out all the stops. If he loses, it, it doesn't change much. I mean, it'll, it'll yeah. be the same thing that everyone always kind of thinks. You can't beat Utah. You can't win big games. You know, you couldn't get to 10 wins. We, we got one more win than we did last year. But if he wins, the reward is so high. Um, and we've talked about this a lot. I don't think it will completely overshadow his legacy, but a win – 100th win, another 10 win season, and a win over Utah this year would be huge for Broncos' legacy. So I think he, here we go again, rolls the dice and and plays his best hand. And um, I, I, I'm out of gambling metaphors, but I really do think that a Bronco on the defensive side is going to really gamble a lot and and really put the pressure on a lot to try to really shake up Travis Wilson, who has been inconsistent this year. Um, well, I was going to ask you your thoughts, Aaron, but it looks like you're having a little bit of a meltdown technologically, and it's time to go anyway. So we will talk more about this post game on Sunday. Um, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you all next week again. We are the Sports Bros. 
Uh, our regular time is Sunday evening, but this is a special edition on Wednesday evening. Catch us on tornbysports.com. That's our online home. Follow us at Sports Bros. You can download all our podcasts on Stitcher or iTunes. You can also download them or watch them on YouTube or tornbysports.com. Also go to tornbysports.com to read all our articles and all our thoughts on everything BYU sports. So thanks again for listening. We'll catch everybody this weekend, and go Cougs!